Ah, uh, <laughs> um, so welcome to um, this uh, special outside salon, which has been possible thanks to uh, the encouragement of the Fields Institute, uh, which has some uh, uh, program, special programs for outreach. So not only were we able to do one night, but we are able to do three. And, uh, and of course, uh, somebody else came to help, like the Embassy of Italy, and that's why we have so many Italian uh, guests here. And uh, we had the, uh, the Center for Drama and um, a bunch of other uh, people who have helped as individuals or as uh, uh, groups. Um, so uh, this is uh, the outside salon, but it's also uh, these uh, outreach uh, um, uh, program called Emergent Form. And uh, I put on purpose some uh, um, questions about uh, Emergent Forms because uh, not everybody knows, and there's many uh, um, definitions of uh, uh, what Emergent Form is. So if you want a program, we have some here. Uh, no, you don't need to. Just leave them now. We have them here and over there. Um, we are not uh, um, ruining forest, so if you want them, they are here. Um, don't lose them. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, stuff online. Uh, if you go on accessalon.com uh, uh, slash emergent, you can uh, find the program and you can find the RSVP. So um, a few things about uh, uh, this program. Uh, it's today, tomorrow, and Thursday. And then for um, March for Science, which is on the 14th of April, we're going to be in Ottawa. Um, it's going to be a new adventure because we really don't know uh, what the public is. So if you know anybody in Ottawa, friends or someone they, you know, just let them know that we're going to be at the National Arts Centre uh, from 11 to 1. So um, I just wanted to start here. So how many people know what Outside Salon is? Okay, most everybody, but not everybody. So Anson Salon is a group and a collective of people. It's artists and scientists who um, would like to have a dialogue about the relationship between art and science and how art and science can benefit each other. So it's not just art embellishing science or science being uh, at the service of art, but it's a reciprocal and very much... Um, um, a coexisting uh, relationship. Um, so this is a, a imp an important thing. And we've been running for several years, and only this year we have so many people. So I'm very, I'm very happy that uh, uh, we have such a um, huge crowd, actually. Uh, so my name is Roberta Buiani, and I'm uh, uh, the uh, artistic director. Um, Stephen Morris is the scientific director, and today he is also the protagonist of this, uh, especially because uh, he, he um, um, theorist, uh, of, of the, like he was one of the the, uh, the people who proposed to do this program. So. But before we start, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, we're actually on a sacred land. Uh, at Actually, the University of Toronto is on the sacred land, and it has been the site of humanities for 15,000 years. And there's still a lot of indigenous people living here. It's their land. So I'm very grateful that we can do this, because without them, we would not be here. Um, so just like you've already heard, uh, this is the territory of uh, uh, the Yurong Wendat and Petun First Nation, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and others. Um, so I just wanted to remind you this, and uh, um, even if this isn't scientific um, or science uh, art related um, event, I think we should keep this in mind. Anyway, um, so. Um, Let's start. So the first uh, person to go will be uh, Stephen Morris, uh, who is a professor of physics at the University of Toronto. Uh, most uh, uh, people know him, and he's uh, quite known for being the Mr. Icicle person. Like, how do they call you, Mr. Freeze? Freeze. 
Uh, but he not going to talk about high school today. Not to talk about it, but he will still do a little bit of experiments. Um, this um, Stephen will be followed by uh, Charles Soares, who comes uh, uh, to us from California, from San Francisco, and I will introduce him later. Um, then uh, Pierluigi Capucci, who is coming from Italy, and Ron Wilde, who is a local artist uh, uh, who's been working, well, a local artist, but native of Saskatchewan, yeah. right? Okay, so without further ado, Stephen Morris. Now we have to make this work. Oh, don't clap yet. Uh, Roberta has my usual job of controlling the lights. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, this, uh, the, la the other one, that one. Yeah, unfortunately, it's kind of dark, but that's what we get for lights. Uh, the theme of tonight's uh, discussion is this uh, rather vague term of emergent form. And I hope that uh, the answer to what emergent form is emerges as we progress through the evening. Uh, I, what I think is going to happen is that each of us is going to, to say what they think emergent form is. And at the end, we'll sort of have a discussion and see whether we've converged or emerged on any, uh, any kind of uh, rational meaning of that term. Um, I uh, work on emergent pattern formation as my job, and I'm from physics. So I get to plant the physics flag on what emergent form is. And I presume that my, my successors in the, on the stage here will plant their own flags and different, different interpretation of emergent form. Uh, um, basically, I would like to first define what I mean by emergence. And emergence is the complex, uh, is what, what happens when complex or self-organized ordered structures arise from simple parts, but in a way which is really not obvious or not easily deduced from the parts. Um, it's really a problem of prediction. In science, we typically take a reductionistic point of view. We take the house and we tear it apart down to the bricks, and then we decide we need to understand bricks by tearing them down into, into you know, sand, and then we try to tear the sand down into atoms, and then we try to go all the way from atoms to bricks to houses again. And this is uh, the sort of standard way that physics works anyway. Um, but the problem with that is that a house is more than a pile of bricks, and, uh, and so the thing that emerges when you assemble the bricks is something more than just a pile of bricks. And so we, I think of that thing as an emergent form. It's not amenable, typically, to a traditional reductionistic explanation. And what usually happens is, uh, as you're trying to understand an emergent form or an emergent property, uh, you find yourself inventing uh, languages and structures uh, in which to discuss your explanation of why it's doing what it's doing. Uh, and those objects are, are usually called coherent structures. And they're somehow larger than the parts, but smaller than the whole. So it's as if you can't take the step all the way from the whole to the parts. You have to make intermediate steps and intermediate explanations. And as you, as you move through this hierarchy, you have to invent new, uh, new words and new languages and new, new dynamics to talk about these things called coherent structures. So for example, the thing that's on the poster, you may have wondered what that green thing is. It's actually a Brussels sprout, my favorite vegetable. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's a section Brussels sprout, and you might say, well, what's emergent about the section Brussels sprout? Well, what's interesting to the physicist here is this crumpled pattern of, of leaves inside. It's all crumpled up, and that looks just like everything else you've ever seen that's crumpled. So there's a, a kind of a universal thing, which is if you take an elastic sheet and you give it the right sort of stresses, it will uh, fail by crumpling and buckling and folding up. And this happens in plants. It happens in crumpled uh, plates, on tectonic plates on the earth. It happens in crumpled paper. Crumpling is, is a thing. It's a thing. So the, the coherent structure here are these little crumples and folds. And so you might say, well, OK, but we know that this is a plant. So everything in the plant is given by its DNA. And this is sort of the dogma of biology. But if you tear apart the, the DNA of, this, of the Brussels sprout, nowhere will you find a blueprint for these little crumples and folds. They are emergent from the recipe of making it. There isn't nearly enough information in the DNA to describe all the position of every piece of the plant after it's finished growing. Those things all emerge as it grows. So the plant, in some sense, doesn't know. The DNA doesn't know, and it doesn't need to know where the little crumples will be. In fact, if you take two genetically identical Brussels sprouts and grow them under identical conditions, they'll crumple differently because the crumples are not encoded directly by the DNA. They're encoded very, very indirectly. So, uh, so we need to understand these kinds of structures using a language which is appropriate to this level of description. And in fact, the fact that this is a plant and that it has DNA is completely irrelevant to discussing the crumples because they're emergent. We needed a language to talk about something at the scale and the time scale of the, of the emergent parts. 
And the idea that different subsystems, systems which are different at the microscopic scale, come sometimes completely different, like the plates on the Earth and the leaves in a Brussels sprout, might seem to have nothing to do with each other. But if you put the same stresses on them, they're both thin elastic plates and they'll buckle and crumple in the same sort of way. And that feature of nature is called universality. So we often find simple, similar uh, coherent structures across systems which are completely unrelated to each other at the microscopic scale, but at some kind of intermediate level of description, they have universal features, okay? sometimes uncannily universal features. So that's a, that's a buzzword we like to use called universality. So basically, the idea of studying emergent structures is to identify the coherent structures and understand how they uh, relate to other systems which have similar coherent structures and to look for examples of universality. And this is a, a paradigm for doing science which is completely unrelated to reductionism. We don't tear apart the, the Brussels sprout until we get down to the protons and the quarks, okay? That's a useless way to understand the Brussels sprout. Don't tell the particle physicists, okay? But even particle physicists these days believe that the proton is emergent. They even believe that space and time themselves are emergent from some unknown other theory. Let's not get into it, okay? But we don't need to talk about atoms. We don't need to talk about anything like that to talk about the crumples because they happen at a scale and in a manner which is appropriate uh, to discussing uh, the Brussels sprout at that scale, and things at the smaller scale are just washed out and unnecessary to talk about. Okay, so I thought rather than just talk theory here, I'd show you an example, a really obvious, uh, really simple, simple laboratory example in which I can make emergence happen before your very eyes, okay? And this thing called the Maxi experiment, and it's named after Hernan Maxi, who is a professor in, uh, I think it's at CCNY in New York City, and he, uh, he and his collaborators um, worked on this very nice, simple experiment. It's two uh, uh, transparent plastic plates, and I have them right here. In fact, I'll turn my little light on. Two transparent plastic plates, and you get a funnel, and you pour into that funnel a mixture of sand grains. The white sand grains in this mixture are large. They're actually table salt. And the black sand grains are about, are, are about one-third the size of the white ones. So there's two kinds of sand grains, white ones and black ones. And the white ones are three times the size of the black ones. And we arrange things so that they're mixed in the funnel and they pour out at a constant rate uh, in a mixed way. And what's going to happen is a little heap is going to pile up here and we're going to watch the heap grow as I pour it in there. So what do you think is going to happen? This is great, you see. So suppose I now gave you one of these grains. I gave you a little handful of them. And I let you have the, all the computer power you wanted in the world. Could you predict? without ever having seen it, what will happen in this simple experiment? Well, how would you do it? Well, if you're a physicist, what you'd do is you'd try to think about uh, the Newton's laws, the equations of motion for each individual grain, and you try to understand how the grains are going to behave from starting from some kind of dynamics of individual grains. Um, what will happen is something surprising, okay? Something I claim that unless you'd seen this experiment before, you wouldn't have guessed. And if you were given those grains and all the computer power in the world, you would never have predicted. Okay? But once you see it, oh, once you see it, we'll talk about it. Okay? So let me show you what it looks like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I hope this works, I'm going to uh, use Photo Booth, which is a little program which projects the screen, projects this. So you can't, there's nothing in the plates now, so it's kind of bright. But as the grains come down, you'll see them pile up in there. And so this is just my little bottle. And I need to kind of make sure it's mixed up. And right uh, at this point, which is where the funnel is, what I need to do is I need my, I need to get my light sort of <laughs> a little less bright on the subject matter here. Uh, it's probably going to work. So there's the funnel at the top where the cursor is there. It'll take a few minutes. The great thing about experiments is they don't always work perfectly. Every person who does an experiment in front of an audience is taking a risk. It might be that it won't work. <laughs> uh, so now I've got so much light that I got. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so I need it to autofocus, you see. Oh, that's working well enough. Okay, so the pile starts to grow. And it's made of members, it's made of black grains and white grains, and the white grains are larger. And so as the pile grows, nothing obvious happens. 
except what you'll notice is that the toe of the pile gets a little whiter than the top. So up here it looks kind of gray, but down here it looks kind of white. And so if you sort of uh, watch it grow for a while, you'll notice something funny happens, which is that the little hesitating is actually a video effect, so don't worry about that. Every so often, you'll notice, if you watch it continuously, uh, that the sand does not flow smoothly. So even though the sand is flowing in from the funnel at a constant rate, it does not slip down what's called the slip face, which is the thing you see sliding here. It does not flow down there at a constant rate. In fact, an oscillation begins to develop. So you might think that this is a constant flow problem, and if I'm putting it in at a constant rate, it should flow out at a constant rate, flow down the hill at a constant rate. But that's not what happens. As, it, as the uh, sand flows down the hill, you see that it stops and starts. And every time it stops and starts, um, there's an oscillation of the flow rate. So wait for it. Uh, there's a kind of pl plugging effect where it stops flowing. And then it flows suddenly in a kind of avalanche. Okay, so now it's sort of dammed up. And now there'll be a sudden uh, avalanching flow about now. It's easier to see with my eye than it is with the camera. Okay, so now the white ones reach the bottom again. And then after a while, the, uh, the flow will kind of dam itself up again and stop. So now it's basically stopped again. And then there's another overflowing cycle. And what you see is that each time that cycle oscillation occurs, uh, it leaves behind a stripe. Okay? So this is a weird situation. Normally, you would take, you'd assume if you take big grains and small grains and you kind of agitate them in some way, that you'd assume that any kind of agitation would just make them more random and mix them up. But it turns out in this particular situation that the, uh, the things unmix. They separate from each other. Okay? They become rich in black ones or rich in white ones in an alternating sort of way. So we put in constant forcing, that is we make a constant flow of constantly mixed grains, and out comes an oscillatory flow and segregation, as it's called, so separating of, of the colors, and the colors are tied to the sizes. Okay, so now it's really going, okay? Now you see the toe of the pile is very white, there's almost no black ones down there, and all the black ones are segregated into these stripes. And if you look at it very closely, you see the stripes get farther and farther apart. And the reason the stripes get farther and farther apart is essentially it takes it longer and longer to slide down the slip phase because the slip phase is getting longer and longer as the pile develops. Okay, does that make sense? Would any of you have predicted this outcome of the experiment? Oh yeah, sure, I knew it was gonna do that. Now, okay, you didn't predict it. But it seems real simple now that you see it, right? Okay, I guess I'll stop the experiment at that point. I'll go back to my slides here. Okay, so this is in case the experiment didn't work, I've got this. Okay, so what you see is these stripes. And this is a good picture because you can look, you can see the individual grains there. Okay, so once you see the effect, it's very simple to come up with the coherent structures that you need to explain it. And it's even possible, which although I will not subject it to you, it's even possible to write a mathematical model or mathematical theory which produces, reproduces the effect from a simple mathematical picture. But only after you've seen it, right? So here's what you see. First, you get a mixture of big grains and small grains sliding down. And what you'll notice is that there's something that's called the dynamic sieve effect where the small ones, everybody's bouncing around randomly, but the small ones have a, a tendency to find their way through the big ones and find their way to the bottom of the, of the, of the fluidized slipping part. And once they're in contact with the, content, with the grains that are uh, not moving, they have a high probability of getting stuck. So as the thing is sliding down there, the black ones have a tendency, which unfortunately in this picture are little white circles, okay, so I've inverted the colors. Um, the, the, the black ones have a tendency, the, the small ones have a tendency to get stuck, and all the big ones make it to the bottom. So that explains partly why the toe of the pile is so white in the experiment, because those are the big ones. And then the big ones kind of pile up at the bottom and develop a kink. And that kink uh, uh, zippers its way up the, up the pile, okay, until it plugs the flow. And then for a moment, the flow stops. And then the thing overflows, and you go back to square one again, right? And each time the, the zipper goes up and down the slip face, which it does periodically, uh, then you get a, a stripe. And the stripe spacing depends on how long it takes for that process to happen, and that depends on how long the slip face is. So now I can go to my blackboard, where the blackboards were surrounded by blackboards, we can start making a model, okay? And we can explain everything with some parameters that we have to kind of guess. But having seen the data, we can now take data about how big the stripes are and all this sort of stuff. We can vary all the parameters of the problem and uh, Maxi and his collaborators did all that. And now we have a reasonable understanding of the phenomenon. 
So here's the kicker. If I hadn't shown you the experiment, and you wouldn't know that these, uh, this, these were the correct coherent structures to, to describe the phenomena in, you have to have seen it, right? But once you see it, once you have the language to discuss how it works, then you, know, you can explain it in a, in, a, in a satisfactory sort of way. Okay? And the key to the thing is, is that uh, word explain. In science we, and in life, we want explanation. We don't simply want to reproduce phenomena. Okay? So if I were to say to you, if you came to my lab and I showed you this, I'm going to stop in two minutes. If I showed you this experiment, and, and you said, wow, why does it do that? And I went over to my computer and said, in this computer, I have simulated the exact motion of 10, you know, of 10 bajillion little particles in here using Newton's laws and laws of friction. And after you know, two months of running a supercomputer, I produced you know, a stripe pattern. So there, that's why it does it. You wouldn't say, oh, now I see, right? I can reproduce the experiment in principle by doing a microscopic brute force calculation of the microscopic motions, but it explains nothing, right? It's completely satisfactory as an explanation. So this is a simulation is not an explanation. It's a kind of deep problem. You wouldn't say, oh, that's why it does. You'd say, oh, come on. All you've done is another experiment. All you've done is an experiment in the computer that does the same thing. And so, of course, it does the same thing, but you haven't explained anything. So now you go, what constitutes an explanation exactly? So now taste comes into it. How simple an explanation would you like? Here's an explanation in a few lines on a blackboard talking about coherent structures, which I've just you know, observed by doing the experiment. Is that enough? Is that an explanation for you? Or do you require to know where every grain and the motion of every grain? Okay? If you require where every grain is and the motion of every grain, then you need a simulation. And that doesn't seem like an explanation. If all you really want to know is intellectually why it works, then you need a kind of uh, a scale of description which is appropriate to the problem. And that is inevitably simpler than knowing where every grain is. Okay? So do be, to be explanatory, every account has to use coherent structures which are somehow, whose dynamics is somehow deducible and their interactions are deducible. Um, but they're hard. Those, those uh, coherent structures are, are essentially impossible to guess a priori. Even when I handed out you know, little handfuls of the grains, you would never know how fast the slip face moved up, how fast the zipper moved up the slip face. You wouldn't even have known there was a zipper. How could you start? Right? Yeah. So emergent forms require something more than a merely reductionistic explanation. And that's basically what makes them so fascinating and interesting. End of story. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so. We're usually, we're usually doing um, questions at the end because we want to have a panel after this. Um, so I'm inviting uh, now uh, Charles Soares, who is, uh, as I said, from uh, San Francisco. He is um, an artist who's been doing a lot of public art uh, that deal with uh, natural phenomena and will show you something. And he's also the uh, exhibition designer uh, for the Exploratorium, which is the Science Center in San Francisco, I guess. Yes? yes. OK, thanks. OK. Hi. Um, let's see. So, uh, so um, I've worked at the Exploratorium for about 20 years, and I've had the good fortune to be able to follow my nose about uh, and the things that I make. Um, they have been really responsive to to my aesthetic, and um, and I've been allowed to make things. So, so this here is a machine, and you can see in the bottom right uh, left right corner for you guys um, what the machine looks like that allows you to form ice. On a on a table, basically, it's a it's a window where there's light coming through, and I have a little diagram that'll show you. And you get you look at it through uh, polarizers, and you see these colors of the ice crystals. And uh, so there's the diagram of the. So you have a coolant flowing through this window, and you have a light box underneath, and a polarizing filter below, and one above. And um, you get a bunch of, uh, when, and, and so you can do this in real time. As a, as a visitor, you can just uh, spray water on the surface and uh, watch it freeze. Or in this case, the water was super cooled, um, so it's freezing very quickly. And I can just rub my hand across, and it creates a nucleation point for the crystals to form. 
And there's a, a, the crystals are very different um, in their form when they're supercooled water versus um, when, they're, when they grow slowly, which you'll see in a minute. So here's the sprayer, I spray a little, and this is all real time, I'm not, it's not sped up or anything. So it's a little slow in here, it, um, but you'll start to notice that around the edges, um, uh, I can maybe point them out, uh, around here you'll start to see little spikes like right here are growing out here. And, um, and those grow kind of uh, feathers, like long kind of overlapping feathers versus up here, which is the super cooled ice form. And this is out where people can just do it. They can experiment with it and see it. And, um, and we have a Thursday night um, adults only night and we serve alcohol. And so every Thursday night, people pour beer into it to see what it'll do, um, which is great, but it's a little frustrating because I have to clean it out every Friday morning. Um, so, uh, and the, the colors develop as the ice gets thicker. Um, and, you know, for each of these things, there's a long story of how they were made, like, uh, Pumping super cold fluid through a glass tank turns out to be a little bit difficult, and so I broke some glass originally, and I made some wrong choices, but it worked out in the end. Um, this is a, a ferrofluid um, between two glass plates, and uh, you move a magnet around underneath the table, and the ferrofluid wants to, um, to organize itself into this pattern. Uh, and it, there's sort of a, a, a conflict between the magnet wanting to kind of force everything apart and the, the, the um, fluid wanting to stay together, to hold itself together. And it resolves itself in that kind of labyrinth pattern. Uh, and that's what it looks like, it's a little intimate Thing where two people can sit and and uh, and look at this and talk about it together. Um, this is a uh, if you can kind of call this generally a, a, a stream table or a flow table. Um, these are the white is actually tiny little bubbles uh, that are um, floating on the surface. And I learned how to make those bubbles in one of the other exhibits when it was a, it was a mistake. Um, and then I figured I could make this um, flow. And so it allows you to see those structures which were called vortex streets. Uh, at certain flows, you get this oscillatory um, movement. Uh, also on that sort of turbulence uh, is this is, this is actually a fog. And you see that spinning thing is, it's actually, uh, there's a laser that's spinning around describing a plane of light. And uh, you only see it because the camera and the, the frame rate interacts with the frame rate of the, or the spinning of the laser. And it gives you a slice of the fog. And so there's my hand just moving it around. And it's, it's delightful because people uh, are confused at first about what it is because it looks like a fluid. And then they reach in tentatively shocked to find that their hands are dry and then and, and then they figure it out which is a really great place to be uh, getting people to that kind of they're just on the edge of knowing what it is and then they know then they know where it is what it is so it's so it causes them to stop for a moment and consider um, and that's what it looks like um, it's basically that form it's a simple um, also, so um, about, two th about in like 2000, I got interested in uh, emergence and pattern formation, and uh, I started looking on the, online, you know, and it was relatively new. <laughs> and I found all these scientists, and Stephen Morris was one, who um, had really beautiful looking experiments. And, um, and so I 
kind of set about trying to recreate some of those. And uh, this one actually was, I was trying to recreate something else, and I had a, I had a little time actually where uh, Stephen and I were in Ann Arbor, and the thing we were trying to do just wasn't working out. And he said, well, you know, there's this thing, if, uh, if you have a fluid on a plate and you flip it over, it drips in these ways. And then I just started playing with that and it uh, came up with that piece. And, and that's sort of the form. It's a little, uh, I'll go back. So this, oh, what, I hope I, oh, what did I do? Wrong button. Um, this flips over, this is the screen on top. So this is the chamber that's filled with fluid and you can see the little drips here. And there's a light down here that's shining up, projecting onto that surface. And so you can flip it over and see the drips from the other side and then flip it this way. And um, that's... <laughs> um, then sand, if you shake sand, you can get all these forms, these uh, patterns that emerge based on the, the um, frequency and the, the amplitude, the volume. And I have this iPad... Um, interface, which allows you to kind of move around in both those domains, frequency and volume, by just moving your finger along these. And you can s create all these patterns um, at will. And uh, it's one of the things that I, I like to do is to actually, I've seen pictures of these things, and, and then I read descriptions of what they were, and then I tried to make them to be able to give people the experience of actually experience in them, sort of like, like Stephen did with the, with the uh, sand pile here. Um, and so there's, there's the device, um, and there's the iPad. Um, and it's actually, this is a funny story, is that it's on a speaker, and it turns out that these speakers are made for this hobby that some people have, which is they, they go to competitions to see who can blow the window sh out of their car. <laughs> So these speakers are quite affordable, and they have a tremendous power. So uh, I can put things on top of them and shake them, and it's OK. So what a wonderful hobby. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of go through some of the patterns that you get out of it, um, which is probably better than my video that I sh took with my trembling hands. Um, if you put fluid in it, you get also some interesting patterns. Um, so these are the little proto-hexagons, not quite there. Um, and then uh, we have this large vessel. These are actually geysers, but I put a vibrator on the side. And, uh, and so that you get that pattern on the, the, in the water on the surface. Um, so back to turbulence and fog. Uh, when I was doing the fog scanner thing, I just kept looking at the, sorry, the video is a little jumpy. Um, I just kept looking at the, just the beauty of those, of the way the fog moved. And, uh, and it took me a while to figure out how to, how to light it so you could see it. And uh, around this time, these, now they're everywhere, LED strip lights came out and that really was the thing that made it possible. So this is actually the same device <laughs> as the fog scanner, um, but I just taped in some LED strip lights, and uh, and this is still on the floor. The fog thing isn't the, the other one isn't because it needs a really dark space, and that's hard to kind of come by. Um, so these these are on display at the exploratorium. Um, so and it, it's a great. Thing. It's kind of like a fire, you know, you can watch it and it morphs and does these things. And it usually takes people a moment to kind of slow down enough to watch it. Um, and one thing about our museum, which is a little bit hard for the kind of work that I do, is that people always want to manipulate stuff and they, they're a little manic about it. Um, and, and a lot of things I do is me are meant to be watched and observed. Um, but I've been lucky I found a little space in the corner where I can have these, these things out. And, uh, and it's at the back of the museum and people are exhausted by then. So they, <laughs> they're totally fine just watching. Um, this is a classic uh, pattern forming system. 
gosh, that went so fast. I wonder if I can, you think if I do? Um, so it's called the belazov zabotinsky reaction. And um, it's, a, it's a pattern forming chemical reaction uh, where the products of one reaction uh, in the system become the agents of the next reaction. And so this front moves forward as a concentration of different chemicals. And so the, the reaction is always along these front lines here. Um, it's, it's a really interesting thing, and, and it's only when you constrain it between these, uh, in a thin layer that it does this. Normally in a tank they would do it, it would be stirred, and it just changes color from, from red to white. Um, and then, uh, so sand ripples. Um, well, I should go back. This is a tank about, with about a foot of water and about uh, an inch of sand in the bottom. And you just, you can spin the tank and you can also just shimmy it back and forth. And um, when you shimmy it back and forth, you get these ripples that you see on the edge of, you know, at the ocean or on the edge of rivers or because you get that flow that goes through. And, and I actually lifted this directly from a paper. Um, then I made it thinner. Um, so this is a, the gap. This is a clear top. It's filled completely with water, so there's no bubbles. And there's a little bit of sand. And anyway, that gap is a quarter inch, so it's, it's quite narrow. And you, get, you do the shimming back and forth, and you get a, quite a nice diversity of patterns. And uh, I thought I had a, maybe it was at the beginning, a picture of the, the actual form. Um, it's a little table. Uh, in about 2008, we had an opportunity to build some outdoor exhibits, and I built this thing called Sky Mirror. And what it is is this dark blue square is a mirror that's at 45 degrees, and it's reflecting the, um, the zenith sky, so it's deep blue. And then that little square is a mirror that comes out of that square and moves this way. And this here is a pedestal where you can control that. You just crank it and it moves out. And it, um, it reflects the horizon sky. And th this is one of those things is that usually when you ask somebody what color is the sky, they say blue. And, and then you realize that it's not just blue. It goes from white to blue, or almost white. And, uh, and that's what this is about. Um, and that's a big thing in my work is trying to point out um, uh, throw a spotlight on things that people don't normally notice uh, and try to get them to notice that. So uh, oh, here's a little video of that movement. And this is, what, I, I, I often video my prototypes and then never get around to videoing the actual thing. Um, and that thing has come and gone. Um, a downside to it is that everyone thought it was a, um, a solar panel. <laughs> um, also, in 2006, I had uh, luck to work on the Laser Inferometry Gravity Wave Observatory. They um, built an education center, and um, I, myself, and uh, a, a guy named Peter Richards, and Sean Lonnie, and Susan Schwarzenberg kind of came up with this idea of these pendulums, and they are uh, coupled with a row of magnets, and then they just move in the wind. So when one one moves, it pulls along its neighbors. And so you get this wave. So this is just in the wind. Um, and so this whole facade, there's, I don't know, 108 or something of these um, along the facade. Um, in 2011, I was able, to, I got a commission to, uh, at the Randall Museum in San Francisco, and I built this wall that uh, of wind directional arrows, and they uh, point, you know, into the wind, and so they show the way that the wind resolves itself with the building, and um, and it's you know it's completely so. This is an emergent pattern for sure, um, because uh, I mean it's it, it's turbulence again. It's but there's nothing built into what I've made here that would make it 
create these patterns. Those patterns are just in the wind and, and the way the wind uh, resolves with the building. Um, And there's 612 of these, these guys. Um, this is a little, you see, uh, uh, this was a pretty good windy day and you, you can actually see the shape of the arrows a little better, but. Um, I can't remember. So you get the idea. Um, I'm going to skip that. Sorry, uh, and that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Some, um, so my most recent piece, uh, which installed last June, are these things called solar totems, and um, so there's three logs, and they've been carved with a special uh, shape trough in them. And in the center of that trough sits this glass, or, or not glass, water-filled sphere. And it focuses the sun's rays. And it burns into the log every day. And every night, it moves a quarter inch up. And um, I get a text every night when it moves so that I, I'm always aware of its condition. Um, and it gives me the like cur motor current and things like that so that I, can, I know if it's b about to fail, hopefully. Um, and so in this way, you, you record sunshine, and you get some of these little gaps. And those are passing clouds. And um, so, so each log does a year. And in June, I have to move it, this apparatus, to the next log. And then the previous log will stay there as a, um, as a permanent archive, of, or, or until it gets vandalized. to. <laughs> beyond recognition, but people really like it. So it's been really uh, fun. I love going out to just to check on it because people always want to talk about it. And they stop by every day, like they do a walk. Or one woman said she walks her daughter to school and has the whole time that she's been going to preschool, this log has been you know, uh, documenting it in some way. So it's really gratifying. And uh, that's really, I think, where I'm at. This is, uh, oh, there's some more of the patterns, but um, that's, that's the end. I'm going to use this one or the... Use this one. So I'm uh, um, just introducing the next speaker. The next speaker is Pierluigi Capucci. Uh, from the name, you guess, is coming from Italy. Uh, Pierluigi has been a long-time friend, I guess, with me. Uh, well, is and, and I'm, uh, I think we met uh, at the University of Bologna the first time. I was very young. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, what is important is that he's been uh, uh, creating, is, is an educator, uh, media theorist, and, uh, and uh, uh, publisher, and he's been creating this platform called uh, Noima Lab, which has been documenting a lot of art around Europe and even around the world. And uh, he's been writing about holography, and he's been writing about about a lot of uh, like the early time of uh, uh, new media. So he's also a very good historian. Um, so almost okay. So I'll I'll just leave the uh, well, let's get our the word to you. Yes, I, we're having technical difficulties here. Uh oh, I yeah, think a Brittany is coming. <laughs> it didn't come up where it's supposed to come up, Brittany. Should I touch end presentation? Yes. Yes. You can see it. Uh, oh, so you have this. I speak you? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Higher. 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 Okay. <laughs> 
I'm going to strangle you with this. So try again. Okay. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you. So, um, I want to, to thank before, before starting the ATC Salon and Roberta for inviting me. The Field Institute, uh, that uh, is uh, this beautiful, uh, this beautiful institution that uh, puts together arts and science, and it is a topic I'm very interested in. Uh, the Italian Institute of, uh, of Culture, and uh, all the people that is even are here, I'm trying to 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 uh, listen to what I'm saying. I am not a scientist like. Uh, like uh, the first uh, present and, and uh, I'm not uh, uh, an artist. And in my presentation, I was asked to deal with a topic that uh, uh, I have called the third life, the third life. And it is a topic that I have been developing for uh, uh, some years. What uh, is the third life? Short is the third life uh, are the entities and organisms uh, that have been created, have originated, or have evolved from human culture, and that manifest some behavior of the living, or are completely alive. The first life is a biological life, that is a life of animals and plants, and also our life, of course. The second life, that has not to be confused with the famous 3D meta world, uh, is is a life in the symbolic realm. The symbolic realm is the world of orality, writing, images, and all the historical and contemporary variations. Is it really possible to have any kind of life in symbolic realm? It is what we normally do. And if we sum up the time we spend in, in more or less directly talking, writing, reading, seeing pictures, television and movies, using the web, playing video games, going to talks, to concerts and exhibitions and so on, we should notice that it is a very long time, a relevant part of our life. In the symbolic realm, we achieve information, we get in touch with others, we acquire knowledge, we study and learn, sign contracts, exchange money, close agreements and engagements, sometimes lifelong. We fall in love, we assume responsibilities and take some of the most important decisions in our life. In the future, we will be going to live more and more inside the symbolic world. And the third life, in some way, it is a consequence of this. But how did we get there? At some step in life's evolution on Earth, which according to the biogenesis hypothesis started about 3.5, 4 billion years ago, our ancestors appeared and, uh, and in human evolution the symbolic ability finally emerged, that is the use of, uh, the use of sign and symbol to communicate. It was a major force in human evolution. Also, we can't date its origin. What scientists say is that since humans share also in a minor part the symbols, the symbolic ability with primates like chimps and bonobos, our common progenitor that lived approximately six, seven million years ago had potentially, potentially, just potentially this ability. Beyond the direct extension that is communicating by showing the body or body parts or directly handling objects, very archaic pre-human individuals developed the ability to use a small part of the body to point at the world around, inventing the indexical science, which can communicate what is present in time and independent in the body's dimension. By the end of the middle Pleistocene, Oral language is probably able to communicate complex abstract information, and the symbolic communication gains a big jump. The figurative age presented documented evolution. The most ancient 
uh, are the finds uh, to, to date uh, that, uh, that have been recently discovered that are engraved on shells date more than 400,000 years ago, probably made by Homo erectus. Uh, from more than 100,000 years ago, there are uh, finds from the Neanderthals, and finally, from the Sapiens. Images can give to ideas, experiences, and behaviors a stable visual form in space and time, uh, and knowledge is fixed and recorded outside the body, and becomes a document that can survive to the individual's lifetime and can be historically transmitted more exactly than words. Finally, about 7,000 years ago, the first writings appear. With writing, knowledge is also precisely codified and recorded outside the body in a stable form. It can travel through time and space and different cultures. It can be easily and precisely reproduced, recalled, shared, discussed, and elaborated. Contracts and laws can be remotely transmitted and operated without the presence of the author of the document. Writing could be considered as a first form of telepresence. Beyond this generally accepted uh, uh, narration, for a wider approach, it was uh, taking into account some discoveries in Africa that are dated long before the birth of writing. They are the Le Bombo Bone, an engraved bone of baboon date uh, 37 BC, found in the mountains between South Africa and Swaziland, that is considered the oldest mathematical device, and the Aishango bone, another bone of baboon with engravings dated 20,000 BC, probably used as a calculation tool, discovered uh, near Ishango, today nearly the border between Uganda and Congo. Image and writing enhance the human ability to control the present and plan the future. The confrontation with the real world is increasingly transferred into the symbolic dimension that becomes a laboratory where to experiment the complexity of the physical world. The cultural distance between the individual and the physical world widens. The symbolic realm becomes an increasingly autonomous, expanding and restructuring universe that often substitutes the physical world. In the laboratory of symbols, it is possible to test hypotheses and simulate their impact on the world, originating a design ability that gives birth to increasingly advanced artifacts. With the symbol, our ancestors achieved three main and strictly correlated goals, knowledge, protection, and effectiveness. Knowledge in understanding the environment by transducing it into symbols that could be shared, exchanged, discussed, and improved. Protection from the environment, pressure, sent to more and more effective tools, artifacts, and behaviors derived from increasingly complex symbolic models. Effectiveness on the environment, sent to projects, tools, devices, and artifacts built from the symbolic models, which could modify the environment and contrast its pressure. By means of symbols and with the resulting tools, our ancestors began to know, control, and manage the environment. And at the same time, they established some sort of safety distance from the physical world, creating a complex anthropic sphere made of knowledge, projects, tools, artifacts, devices, processes, machines, the cultural evolution had a big boost, reducing the time to adapt to the environment and limiting its pressure, increasing the average lifetime. By sharing knowledge, adopting achievement became much faster and increasingly complex and powerful tool were created to expand the human body and the senses and to deeply modify and even degrade the environment. In the last decades, thanks to biological disciplines, genetics, and related technologies, it has become possible to modify the existing organism and create new ones in a process that, through selection and breeding, has been running since the dawn of humanity. Just 30 years ago, Wilhelm Flusser wondered 
Why isn't the dogs aren't yet blue with red spots and that horses don't yet radiate phosphorescent colors over the nocturnal meadows on the land? Why hasn't the breeding of animals still principally an economic concern moved into the field of aesthetics? These questions do not really constitute a provocation. What Flusser imagined has been achieved since a long time. Many domestic animals, as well as many flowers and plants, have been selected for purely aesthetic or utilitarian reasons, or for both. They would have never existed without the human intervention that created and protected them. Scientific and technological evolution seem leading to an extension of the idea of life from organic ecosystem with plants and animals to a landscape with very different subjects, organisms, organic, inorganic, and mixed. Some of them are really here, some others are just promised, but they seem to identify the clear direction. Examples are inorganic immaterial entities from artificial intelligence, artificial life, autonomous agents and algorithms, inorganic material entities such as increasingly sophisticated machine devices and robots, artificial and expanded organisms obtained by creating, cloning and modifying natural subjects through synthetic life, artificial organisms newly created through synthetic uh, biology and, genetic, uh, and genetics, Hybrid entities that combine organic and inorganic elements, as in the field of, of biorobotics, while the de-extinction promises to revive extinct organisms. The rise of a symbolic intelligence in human ancestors generated the explosion of tools and articles that profoundly changed the interrelation with the environment, shaping the anthropic sphere we know. According to McLuhan, they are extension of the body, of the senses, and of the nervous system. Sometimes we are in such a deep relation with machines that we can do with them what we have never been able to do with humans, for instance, communicating with thought. Now it seems we are going beyond the extension era, since these forms are growing increasingly uh, are growing increasingly complex and, and autonomous, and because of the anthropic environment's pressure, they are evolving as real living entities, organic, hybrid, and inorganic. The third life does not arise from a general biological evolution, but from the evolution of a particular species, expanding nature from within its own domain. It is designed, created, and selected by the anthropic sphere through a cultural process, from what it is called the artificial, this is the natural peculiar of human species. The more the anthropic sphere expands and develops, the more the third life will proliferate and evolve. The third life started operating with a symbolic acquisition. There is a trace of it in religions and myths, gods and heroes, in unicorns and dragons, uh, centaurs and chimeras, uh, cyclops and sirens, in the wonderful medieval bestiary, in the superheroes. Many of these legendary creatures are still living today in movies and in human imaginary. But the dream of really creating life has been pervading all the human history worldwide, from machine and automata to robots and biological organisms. To what extent will humans be able to lead and manage the standing process? Will this, will this configure an evolutionary leap, the diaspora of a species that cancels itself in its cultural heritage? Since with a symbolic acquisition, the human species has been able to influence the biological evolution. While evolution has no finality and programs, we are consciously overwhelmed by projects and goals we set in the future. Future is the place for invention and visions, for innovation. Humanity seems compulsively future-driven, reimagining itself in the future, trying to address it in a favorable way. Consequently, many people imagine, many people imagine a triumphant future where humans will live longer in power and glory. And beyond this bare biology, 
in peace with other non-humans animals and with the environment, intimately collaborating with machines and devices, severely protected from the harsh aspect of life in some sort of an Arcadia. Many ideas that for centuries have been pivotal for the existence of societies are part in discussion, redefines the meaning and the limits of human nature, human condition, and human culture. This process can be noticed in the attention that today is paid to the environment issues and to the non-human animals' rights, and it is evident in movements like transhumanism and posthumanism. This is a very desirable hypothesis, but it's not the only one. The symbolic hypertrophy gave birth to a huge number of cultural variables, like religions, memberships, beliefs, languages, values, interests, visions of the world, generating what 50 years ago Ericsson called pseudo-species that pursue different and often violently conflicted purposes, as today it is even evident worldwide. These make increasingly difficult to share a common vision and consequently a shared intention towards global and alarming phenomena, like for instance the climate change. The cultural evolution has made the human species an abnormal member of planet Earth, the last remaining branch of genus Homo, the conqueror of any environment and today the exploiter of a unique immense ecological niche whose resources is intensely dissipating. But the Anthropocene could not last forever. According to some scholars, the price of symbolic hypertrophy, the price of language, would be the end of human species. Its cultural magnificent would be the cause of its extinction. Humans are not essential to nature. Some scientists have even imagined an Earth without humanity. Earth could go on without humans, as it happened in the vast majority of its history. In the turn of geological times, the human biology and a large part of its human artifacts would be quickly reabsorbed into the Earth's biology. Perhaps, to the human short parable, could survive a part of its culture, the life form that humanity created from itself beyond its limits, pervading life and evolution with its culture. The third life could then be the humanity's true legacy, its lasting present. Thank you. So the last speaker is Ron Wild. Um, he is, um, some of you might have seen his work uh, elsewhere. Um, and uh, if you have a look, uh, when you exit, there are three, three pieces. Uh, two still hanging in here. One is behind the counter out here. And when you go down the stairs to leave, if you look up, there's a piece that's of art that's uh, also one line hanging there. Yeah, and uh, he's been uh, known for making these uh, huge maps, and you can go online and, and uh, go and explore them that have like a lot of connections and a lot of uh, like a very, very complex network. And uh, if you want to see his latest exhibition, you have to go all the way to Vaughan. Uh, uh, I went there, and uh, they gave me all of these uh, um, uh, nice uh, brochures, so if you want some, I'm going to put some there so you can actually admire his work and go and see the exhibition, which is up until... Uh, end of June, anyway, maybe a week into July. Okay. Yeah. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. So while this is uh, it's flipping through, it takes a little over a minute and it'll, it'll go through a few times. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just uh, start by talking how I got to be doing what I'm doing. About uh, 15 years ago, while I was living in Edmonton, I was working as a uh, graphical interface experimental developer, which meant I had this idea, which I still uh, very much believe in, which is to provide a, a mapping interface to information, um, even though we're so familiar with it that we, we can't think of any other 
possible way we would search for information. This idea of going to a computer, blank screen with one box, typing in a word, hitting go and having no idea what's going to show up um, uh, seems to be pretty effective. But my idea is that we would, would start with more what our brains have been evolved to, uh, to do in terms of navigating and wayfinding and milestones and is a, is a visual, basically a map of information where you would zoom in uh, into something you're interested in, get closer, you know, different detail would appear, and you'd navigate your way to what you wanted to find. Um, so that was the idea I was working on. Uh, I was working, in, because it's a visual idea, I was wor working in, in visual ways. Like I wasn't typing out words or sentences of what it would look like or how it would work. I was grabbing uh, symbols or met uh, visual metaphors or ideas from different applications uh, about my idea and sort of combining them. And then every couple of weeks, I would combine them all together and just as a visual note keeping system for myself of the work I'd done the last couple of weeks, how my ideas were evolving, and and seeing what connections were forming and what I wanted to spend the next week uh, focused on. So as I was doing and working in this manner, uh, people would walk by and see see my screen or look over my shoulder. And, and if they didn't know me, they were saying, you know, are you an artist? Was this art? And I would say, no, this, this I'm not an artist. I'm a graphical uh, interface, you know, developer and experimental uh, developer. And this is my visual note keeping system. So that was what I was focused on um, for the longest time. Uh, my wife and I moved here to Toronto in 2008. And by this time, uh, and then when people here started saying, you know, is this art, are you an artist? Uh, I finally threw up my hands and said, I don't think so, but I'll let somebody else decide. So I um, uh, saw an ad in the Globe and Mail at that time for something called the Artist Project. And I thought, well, this is, people think this is an artist project, so I'll let them decide. So I applied and I did, had no idea what I was doing or getting into and um, was accepted and, and things have gone from there. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, maybe this as well. Um, so what this uh, is, is, is actually one of my works. I'm going to show it in more detail later and talk about it in more detail. Um, but um, I, I still call what I, I make maps because when I, uh, I'm working on something, I don't start off with any composition or any structure or anything that a normal, um, traditionally trained artist would do. Um, I, I basically microcompose. I, as I did with my visual note keeping system, it really hasn't changed. I, I grab uh, little elements that represent whatever it is that I'm uh, working on and basically collage them together. So they're just basically digital collages, uh, Photoshop, montage, uh, many layers. Uh, this one, for example, is called the Nonlinear Map. Uh, it features the work of famous University of Toronto professor Stephen Morris, who you heard from first. Um, so when I when I met uh, Stephen, uh, I asked you know if I could do a map of his research, and uh, and this is is what I ended up coming up with. Um, and I've done collaborations with. Uh, four or five uh, visiting mathematicians here at the Fields Institute. I'm going to show you one that I did with, uh, with Rodrigo uh, in a few minutes. So each of these has um, about 80 to 100 uh, different graphical elements. Um, uh, some of them I do a lot of work on just as an individual element before they get put into the collage. Generally, they, they get placed um, basically intuitively. Um, I don't overthink where something is going to go or how it's going to look, but I, I will play a little bit around with its opacity or transparency um, and putting it next to or over or beside uh, some other, ele other elements. Um, my main purpose is not really to create uh, a nonlinear map uh, in this case, um, even though um, if somebody was to ask me, you know, or my wife or somebody say, you know, what does Stephen do? I would have a hard time explaining it without having, um, you know, this something like this in front of me, where I could see um, and be reminded of the different elements of his work and the kinds of things he does. And I could speak for a long time about Stephen by looking at this, whereas with a, a blank uh, piece of paper, I would I would struggle. Uh, so that's um, just a these that isn't wasn't a. Um, a, uh, a time 
uh, time lapse. Uh, I just wanted to show how it was put together. It wasn't necessarily put together in that order. Um, so here is uh, the, the same uh, work of art, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, the nonlinear map um, on a platform called uh, Gigapan. So um, this is, is, is live here. Um, you can focus uh, in, uh, in great detail. It uses a, basically a Google map uh, interface um, where you can zoom in and pan. Uh, I set up um, a few uh, snapshots here just to make it easier if it works and not if it doesn't. Um, on some of these things. So, for example, uh, this is a bit irritating. Um, Abe and Charles was talking about this. Um, uh, the beauty of live performance. <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay, that's really, really fine. Sorry about this. Um, okay, guys, I had my snaps, snapshots blue there. Brief period of time. The, um, this shape here, uh, I inverted the color uh, in the, um, in Charles, it's a, it's a pink or orangey, type of, uh, of color. Um, it's also, uh, he didn't mention, uh, Stephen has an art show on right now, and uh, this, this piece is in that art show in the Oakwood Library for, for a couple more weeks. Um, uh, I wouldn't think that the projector would change this, but it seems to have. Um, Okay, uh, he, he, had, he didn't talk about um, uh, mud cracking, uh, but that's uh, another aspect of, uh, that I've learned uh, of, of Stephen's work. Uh, this is a, you know, a little piece of it uh, worked into the, the collage. He has a, uh, a large piece about this large in his art show um, uh, at, at, the, at the gallery right now. Um, other patterns, uh, I think this is, as far as I know, is, is data, but uh, uh, isn't it, Stephen, this, yeah. it's, is it distance and time? Is that relatively the, the dimensions? Um, so it's data of a, of a washboard road, but the, the data has, has a nice pattern. I actually have something about the washboard road in this piece, too. He does um, work on it. This is actually, this blue part is a, um, a rail line. Uh, I think a streetcar rail, and the, it, the, the cupping motion here, the, the dark and the light, uh, is the, um, the washboard uh, effect that uh, I believe forms with, uh, over time, even on, uh, on something like, like rails. Um, he mentioned uh, some of the patterns are, are fairly organic or, uh, or natural, as this, I'm not sure what kind of vegetable this is. Um, and what else to to show here? Um, this is a. Um, oh, sorry, that's the cracks again. And this, I believe, is the columnar. No. Okay, eroded sandstone. Um, so anyway, nonlinear map. Um, it's uh, it's on Gigapan. If you if you want the link, or you just um, Google and find find where that is. Um, so with these maps, uh, I would, would uh, actually the, the map, the, sorry, the physical artwork is uh, 40 inches by 60 inches, and it's in my art show that Roberta mentioned that's up in Vaughan right now. The nonlinear map uh, is part of that, uh, that exhibition. Um, but I have a lot of friends who are traditional uh, artists, painters, sculptors, a um, uh, few abstract uh, artist friends. Uh, so I wondered why could I not also be an abstract artist uh, here, if you watch closely, it started off very, very blurry and should sharp. Okay, that's the blurriest. Uh, so there, that's complete abstract art. There's no way of knowing why those colors are where they're, they're at. Um, 
You watch it for a little longer and it will sharpen into um, a detailed map of uh, uh, topology and set theory. This is a mathematician from uh, Mexico who was here at the Fields Institute for a year-long uh, mathematical residency. He came to an art show um, that I was doing in Ossington at the time, uh, met him, and I worked with Rodrigo. So the idea is to, I, I work with uh, the knowledge domain expert uh, to find symbols of their research, graphical representations, um, and then just do my, my collage style kind of thing. And, um, uh, but the idea of, um, that some people find these uh, overwhelming, and they, they are, when there's 80 to 100 things all mashed together, that's um, discomforting to, to some people. So I'm thinking they are buying abstract art from my friends, so, you know, colors, put on a canvas, they can, they can buy an abstract art from me as well. And they don't need to know that it's based on anything technical or, or very uh, sophisticated. Um, a friend of mine, uh, collab we collaborated and did a, uh, an app where we deconstructed um, uh, one of my maps as, as a prototype. So basically, I've just taken all the things. You, you just go in here and you can you can drag in whatever's of interest and, and see how easy or difficult it is to collage something that, that looks at all interesting. I think this one we even... <coughs> it also has a, it's tested some animation. So these you can just, you can just throw out what you, what you don't want. Uh, some of the shadow effects or whatever was in the original thing come with it. Um, then you, um, if you're happy with your uh, creation, your collage, uh, and you want a um, physical, not physical, but a, uh, a file of it, of your final thing, you put your email in here, and it will send it to you. Um, so I just did a couple, or I did one last night, and um, uh, so you, you get an email. This is the original um, piece. This is what I did with those 80 to 100 things. And then last night, I just quickly, you know, picked um, a few of the things just to, um, what happened to that pointer? That white pointer thing? Oh, here it is. Um, and um, so same thing, this is online if you want to, to, to try. So this, this head is like here. So that's the head, um, you know, the thumbs there. Um, this little guy is sitting here. So anyway, like I showed you, um, I stuck something there, I made an eye, whatever. Um, you can um, see what you can do there. Uh, he, he actually wanted to do it with, with my work, and, and that was, was interesting. I thought it would also be interesting to do it with uh, Kandinsky. So here's the, the sort of the, the exact same thing where you can uh, make a... Kandinsky uh, piece piece of art, um, or try to and see how easy or difficult it was for him to come up with the shapes that he did. And same thing um, when you're done, um, it'll email you the, the, the photo of it, and then you'll also see what um, what it started as. So I didn't. Um, so what I did, just that's how this happened. So I went in to, to this Kandinsky image and isolated. I didn't do each and every one. This is just a prototype. So I did a few. There's, there's a lot of circles uh, that I did. I did this this big piece. No, I think it's over here, this one. Um, this is the blue triangle. Anyway, so you can try your hand at, uh, at making a Kandinsky with, uh, with that. So it's... So the idea of starting with something and breaking it apart and then just seeing if, if when you try it again, if you get anywhere near or, uh, uh, or not. Um, other than that, the, the thing I was, was going to finish with, really, and then we can just do more in the question and answer period, was, uh, was back to uh, Stephen's uh, nonlinear map, was I... Um, I... Um, I actually did a, a partial uh, abstract of it. Actually, can you turn the lights on for a second, Roberta? So I did a, uh, I, did, I abstracted it 
so the people in the back will, will probably just totally see um, you know blotches of color. The people in the front row, I, I left traces of, of of what was underneath. So again, just I buried the um, transparency and opacity a little bit, um, but to create a uh, uh, an abstract uh, piece of art that uh, uh, even without knowing any of the content or the let alone the physics or meaning of, of the content behind it um, creates quite a uh, as an image I like my goal is to uh, to get this one uh, stretched and framed the same way as the one that's currently hanging in uh, in, in the Vaughn show which is the very detailed uh, version of this and to uh, to have them uh, side by side uh, hanging as a diptych at some point so those are the kinds of things I do with uh, with collaborations with uh, uh, mathematicians uh, from here, mostly uh, scientists from uh, wherever, and uh, medical researchers, and um, how my uh, career has evolved. I know a lot of uh, a lot of young artists and mid-career artists call themselves emerging artists. I think now I can literally say I was an emergent uh, artist participant in this, uh, and I thank uh, Roberta, for, Roberta for that opportunity. Thank you. Okay, so I'm inviting all the speakers to the table. This is two weeks. Uh, I got to hold this button to get the green light on. Okay. So, I'll yep. get this back in the bottle, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You're going to try and put it back in the bottle? Yeah, I'm going to put it back in the bottle. <laughs> got to go back okay, in the so bottle. Okay, so we have a full speaker. Ah, yes, yes. Okay. Free, uh, uh, microphones. So right, we'll, just, we'll, we'll have to We'll just hold one and pass it. Yeah, we, they've got theirs. We'll, we'll share. share. Yeah. And uh, uh, for the audience, so we don't have any uh, anything that we can pass around. So uh, if you ask me a question, please scream. Oh, speak loudly. Especially during the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Bucci, at some point uh, in your presentation, you mentioned something that increased in uh, the extinct Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, there is uh, a discipline, let's call it this way, discipline, a discipline, that uh, promises, because until now uh, there are only promises, of, uh, through uh, some uh, technological uh, ways like uh, genetic engineering, uh, but also more traditional technologies like uh, um, breeding and uh, what humanity has done since uh, since uh, his uh, birth of uh, uh, reviving species that are extinct. It's a very curious idea because uh, if species is extinct, there are many reasons. So take me back then. Uh, implies a lot of problems uh, of money, of course, but that are not only the point because uh, producing a species uh, into an environment that uh, is very different from the one that uh, uh, the species was born and uh, um, any any anyone, it is an idea that some people have and I have put inside the the of the survive. I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> so any question from the audience? Yes. Uh, perhaps a philosophical question. First of all, amazing presentation. I'm totally blown away. 
Uh, I want to ask this idea of the emergent form. Do you believe it's a property of nature, or is this something that we human is, is a, a construct that we humans created because we're always desperate to find matter again? I suspect that the universe is uh, is uh, sort of set up in a way that emergence happens. Otherwise, we wouldn't have emerged. So this is called the anthropic argument. Uh, I don't like the argument that much, but it seems to be true. So if you have a sufficiently complex set of rules, and, and the level of complexity doesn't have to be very high, uh, the emergence, uh, emergence structures happen sort of for free. Uh, and so it, it's a fact that we live in a universe with enough, with enough complexity in its most basic physics, I guess, uh, that, that emergence has happened and does happen. So I suppose we shouldn't be surprised, but it does still seem surprising. Every day when I wake up, I'm surprised, you know? Um, uh, my father-in-law would live to the age of 99, and he used to say, every time I wake up, I, I first check if I'm alive. I mean, I'm surprised if I am. <laughs> so I think we should always be surprised. <laughs> but at the same time, we should be, appreciate that this is just how nature is. And if it weren't like that, uh, we wouldn't be here to be surprised in some weird sort of way. Does that make sense? Even the game of life, you know, this trivial sort of cellular automata game, which only has three rules. I won't describe them in detail. It seems impossible that it would have... But a sufficiently large game of life game is as complex as anything in the universe. It's got, it's maximally complex. So even those trivial little rules are enough to, to in principle, to produce, you know, woolly mammoths, you know. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised that woolly mammoths eventually evolve along with us and everything else. <laughs> I guess, briefly. Uh, no. No, uh, I just showed you two sand grains that uh, the entropy of mixing of this thing is actually reducing during the, the entire experiment. So how the hell did that happen? Well, the answer is that there's friction and it produces more heat than, and that actually increases the entropy. So in fact, an open system like this open system where the, anything can be communicated to the, to the universe does not have to obey the classic form of the second law. An open system can have a, re, a lowering entropy. And this is good because it's, we're all lowering our entropy by learning things and thinking about things. Uh, and that only is possible because we're open and evolving. Okay, so don't, the second law is very restrictive. It only applies to closed systems at equilibrium. So that means systems are sealed off from the universe which, for which we have waited long enough, which is a very long time in some cases, for equilibrium to be established. And that happens really fast for a, you know, a box of argon, but for you know, a cat, it, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't apply. So don't worry about the second law is my basic message. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just to follow up, uh, I wonder if you're familiar with or if you have any thoughts on uh, Jeremy England's uh, thermodynamic theory of evolution. Jeremy yeah. Uh, I guess I, I guess I don't believe it. Uh, no. Oh, um, <laughs> I think there's more to it. It's a nice idea. I would just never use the word thermodynamic for a thing that isn't thermodynamic. Okay. It may be a good idea, but it's not a thermodynamic idea. We should be careful not to use our words that we've already used really well for one system and just sort of appropriate them for another one. Uh, we should make up new words or be more bold, I guess. Uh, this is a, it's sort of a case, physicists do this all the time. They like generals, they fight the last war, right? <laughs> Thermodynamics and the entropy law is so successful that we just go use that template and it's our hammer and we go bash every nail with it, right? Um, but that's, you know, that's how I feel about it. Uh, but, I mean, the ideas are obviously interesting, but I just don't like the way um, it's being couched as if it were some consequence of the second law, which it most emphatically is not. Um, so open systems are not second law obeying systems. Yeah. Thinking because you were, I've always known you were doing the maps, and I always thought of them as maps. And uh, now, when you show the game, this is the first time I've ever seen the game. Oh, yeah, the app, you yeah. You called it a Kandinsky. 
yep. and that you were moving things around, to me, it didn't show, it didn't look like a Kandinsky, it was an emerging rock or an emerging thing. <laughs> so I was thinking, do you uh, think of, I mean, would you expand this and moving away from physics and laying well? Because you are giving the image to a concept, if I understand it correctly, because you're working with mathematicians. Mm -hmm. But would you be willing to kind of generalize it? Because we're moving from what's organic and what happens, and we know this around that, to what is what we so expand that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's part of the, the idea with it. Um, was that uh, why well, I enjoy working uh, actually the more technical the person the more interesting to me um, that's just because I'm interested in technical things and uh, but um, yeah the, the general the general population I think should should have a chance to, to make art to see what it's like to make art people ask me how I do these things so this gives them a chance to try it themselves rather than me trying to explain it is um, is they get sort of tool very easy. You just have to drag these things from the edge to the middle to to um, to make what you want to make. Um, that uh, yeah, one of my messages is that uh, in terms of my interest in the whole art science thing is that uh, um, we, the general population, should be more interested and more involved in science and mathematics and technology and genetic engineering and everything that's coming down the pipe. We don't have to be experts in it, but to to back off is a real mistake. And on the other side of the equation, I think um, scientists, general public, everybody are artists and to not be afraid to, to make art and to go into the art realm that uh, society has been so siloed that you can only be sort of one thing and that we are all hands off because these are expert artists or these are expert scientists. As I, I operate as a cross camp runner uh, going across and uh, like more company uh, in doing that. Oh, Charles. Charles. Oh, so beautiful. Um, so you, you have the funnest job in the world. <laughs> I always tell them that. You got my favorite job. Yeah, no, I just, can you tell us one of your pieces or your most challenging or something that didn't work or something you found and tried to show that you haven't yet or the challenge? I don't know. Uh, sure. Um, well, a lot of things don't work. <laughs> And uh, I guess that's one of the, I don't know, the, the discipline of what I do is to, is to discard things. Uh, you have to be kind of ruthless, I think, um, with some of these ideas. Like, they just don't work out, so let's do something else. But, but sometimes, um, sometimes you just really want to make them work. And uh, so there's one piece that actually uh, is actually the progenitor of the drip patterns, and it's a, it's actually uh, it's a it's a um, a scientific work um, by a French uh, scientist, and I found him online, and now I can't find it anymore, but um, I got his PhD dissertation, and you know I'm not. Canadian, so I don't speak French, and uh, <laughs> and so anyway, uh, I've tried to recreate it, and I've had a terrible time. Um, uh, one time, so when I met one of the first times I actually met Stephen and didn't just talk to him on the phone or exchange emails, I tried to get him to help make this thing, and it was uh, a disaster. It was a disaster. <laughs> well, one of the funny things that happened Can is that describe what the piece is. So. Yes. Okay. So, so the drips. Uh, it, so that drip chamber, you flip it over and the drips drip down. This is a continuously fed drip chamber in essence. So you're always um, putting in more fluid from the top. And uh, one of the things you may have noticed is when you first flip it over, it doesn't know how to drip. And it somehow figures out like where it's going to start making these drips. And it creates a really interesting, weird pattern. But you only see it briefly. And so when it's continuously fed, you actually get to see that. And in his system, you could see spirals and stripes, and then also a more chaotic regime. And it's, it's beautiful. 
And so we uh, tried to get it. First of all, we went to the store and bought a pump and then promptly dropped it and broke it. And then we uh, we got, I guess, we got it working. We glycerin and water yes. as the fluid, but it has to be kind of viscous. <laughs> and we fire up the pump, and of course, if you have any air in glycerin and water and you put it through a violet pump, it turns into shaving cream, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so we basically produced a great big sludgy mess of, of foamed up stuff. And we never found a pump that was you know, powerful enough to deliver the flow. And it's this hard guy to... had somehow done it with two little aquarium pumps, just little things like this. And how did he do it? We couldn't buy those pumps. We couldn't figure out how to get it. To work. And it's beautiful, but we can't make it work. Yeah. <laughs> it's a screen, and above it's got to it's got to have a, a, a head of, of fluid above it uh, that continuously drips through the screen. And then you light it from the side, and you kind of look at it from below, and you can see the pattern of drips coming through the screen. Um, so you've got to keep the, the fluid uh, supplied, otherwise it runs out really fast. And it, you've got to hold a head of several inches of fluid above a screen, which is dripping like mad, and, and we just couldn't get any pumps fast enough to do it. Why did you bring some cheese? Without well, response? you have to. I, I have tried that, actually. Yeah, so. He's tried everything. I, um, well, I, so I, I found, I, I went with a less viscous fluid that's easier to pump. And then I used a finer screen. And um, the funny thing was is that you just had to pump it twice as fast, and still the pump couldn't keep up. So um, it, it, I think it's totally solvable. I just need a bigger pump. But pumps are a little bit expensive. Um, and so, uh, so there's, no, there's no plan for these things. You, you make them and you screw around them until they work, or you quit. And, and I have to say another thing that I've been really lucky, uh, and that, that's something that's amazing in, uh, so the w watch water freeze, the ice thing. Um, there were so many points along that. I mean, I had some problems where I burst the glass and things like that, but um, there, were, there, there are sometimes just lucky choices and it works. And then you try to recreate it. And then you have all these problems problems and you're like what did I do before I don't quite understand like and somehow I was just lucky and uh, and and um, you know that that's I don't know it's, it, it's it's sometimes you're unlucky and then you never persist and then you don't see and, and you know so that's the downside of being ruthless with some ideas is that you might have just been unlucky and uh, but then it's up to somebody else they'll they'll, they'll be lucky Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of design for an educational facility and how it's going to adapt it to be and how much to what the audience has been supported and this all. Well, so I'm lucky in that I have a lot of didactic colleagues <laughs> and so uh, who are um, more concerned about um, presenting uh, 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 concepts and I am more interested in delighting and inspiring people and um, and so but I mean that's not to say like the concepts really are interesting to me and they are intriguing and and um, and I've been trying to figure out a way to present those concepts that is not overwhelming. Um, because sometimes you go to a museum and they're just, there's just too much text to read. And you're there with your, your brother-in-law or something. And you're visiting. And you're not going to stand and read all this text usually. So, so I, um, I'm, I'm interested in the way art museums do it, where they, they have a, a, a catalog and it's got essays and stuff like that. Um, and also, I think we've not, uh, well, our museum has not really done much with the web, which would allow some of that information to be presented sort of at infinite depth, um, where you could just read as much as you wanted to read about it. And then, and when you have time, uh, not when you're visiting with your brother-in-law. Um, so, uh, but I definitely am just trying to, to present something that just makes people think and observe because I think that's a lot of the world there's a lot of stuff going on that people just don't notice 
Like one day I was walking, and I almost put it in here. I was walking, uh, I did a little hike, and there was a mud puddle, and it was, there were waves in it. There were little waves in it. And there was a clear surface and a muddy surface underneath, and there were waves between those surfaces. And I stopped and stared at it, and I started videotaping it, and people would walk by and go, oh, <laughs> videotaping a mud puddle, huh? And, then, <laughs> and I'd be like, look, but, but look, <laughs> look what it's doing, you know? And, and so people sometimes just don't, they just don't notice stuff. And that's a big part of what I try to do is to, is like to show them. And I think video is amazing. It, like that mud puddle video, then people, everyone sees it because it's video. Video puts the spotlight where you want it. And um, when I try to create things uh, that are physical, it's hard sometimes to get people to look at the right thing. And so it's, it's a constraint in the, in the work uh, that I just have to work with. So I've, I've faced this exact question in the art show that's at the, it's at the Oakwood Village uh, Library on Oakwood Avenue, north of St. Clair. I know that's so far north that you can hardly imagine it, but there is a bus that goes right past the, anyway, I have a bunch of pictures of some of the stuff, including a picture of Belisov Zabotinsky. And so now the question is, what do you, what do you say in a completely, like a person coming to this gallery or even not even expecting to see art there in the first place, but what do you say on your little uh, three by five index card <laughs> next to your picture of Belisov Sabatinsky. So I decided what I would do for this show was simply to have the title of it, and it's just called The Belisov Sabatinsky Reaction. And that's sufficiently bizarro that if someone really wanted to, they could Google that phrase. And then they would do exactly as you say, they would be deluged with information about it. But what I did was I put a, a, a QR code next to it, which when you scan it with your phone, uh, opens up the, the video of the thing moving. So for all the pieces in the art show, there's no explanation of the physics about them. There's simply a very matter-of-fact title. And then, if possible, there's a QR code that links to a video, if there is a video for that particular piece. But I don't uh, be didactic about it. So when I'm physically there, uh, I treat it like a poster session. I don't know if, if you're a scientist, you go to these meetings, and a lot of the things are, they don't have time for to listen to everybody talk. So they let you do a poster. So you stand next to a four by eight sheet of uh, plywood with a, a picture of your work on it. And you just stand there. Anybody who comes up to you, you have a conversation with them. So what I do is I just stand there in the gallery. And when somebody says, what the heck is that? Then I tell them what it is. And I start with you know the 10 cent explanation and then maybe the 25 cent explanation. And then I get into more detail if they want. But if they don't ask, then I don't say anything. So it's, I think it's important to uh, impedance match, you know what I mean by impedance match. It's important to impedance match the, the, the information that's given to the minimum customer, but you know, have a kind of gateway to the, to the maximum thing. Uh, and one way to do that is to, is to put in the gallery something that they can pull up on their phone and to take them somewhere. But it's, uh, that's, so that's the only solution that I, I come up with. I don't want it to be too, you know, too, too preachy and too physics-y. I'd like people just to look at it without reading the captions at all at first. And then, you know, if they want to think more about it, then dig into it. But I would say the Exploratorium is a remarkable museum in that it's very, hand, it's very it really lets the, the user um, experience it without a lot of text. Uh, so that's kind of a philosophical thing, I guess. But. I guess my question is mostly for the internals. Um, I'm really interested in getting into doing all the art installations or doing exhibits. Um, and I know that you, you know, you work for the Explorer and you have an art show. Um, do you have any advice on how to find opportunities or funding or venues to be able to get funding? <laughs> I, the reason I now do art shows is because of Ron. Uh, I was on sabbatical and I couldn't leave town because my kids were in high school. And Ron dared me basically to submit my work to, to an outdoor art show called the Riverdale Art Walk. And it cost like $25 or something to join it to submit your artwork. And I got juried into the first thing I ever submitted to. And then, then you have to pay for a tent and stuff. But, so basically, it's real easy to get into low-level art shows. 
uh, if you're willing to spend a few hundred dollars. So I told my wife, well, I could buy a boat. You know, it would be much more expensive as a hobby. <laughs> So, uh, so now I, you know, you, you can kind of slowly work your way in if you start with these these kind of public calls that, that come go up. Uh, that's as far as I ever got. So, so I'll, I'll tell you that um, I do public art because there are calls, um, and it's there's it's easy to understand how to get your foot in the door in a sense, because there uh, there so there's publicart.org. Who knew? And there's. Uh, Callforentry.org, and they uh, so public agencies that have art projects, they post their calls on those formats, and they uh, ask for qualifications, and you send in images and a statement and a resume, and if they're interested, they get in touch with you, and um, um, and I I started doing ones that were local, so that was. That's kind of easier, and they they they're small, so they have a low sort of. They they some agencies have small projects that they'd like to give to new people, um, and the bigger ones, of course, go to the bigger names uh, who they have confidence can create a big piece or something, or have the veritas to to satisfy whatever you know goals that they have. Um, so, so whereas the gallery scene kind of mystifies me, um, you know, uh, so I do that because I, I just read them up on the internet and I'm like, that one sounds interesting. I guess I'll apply to that, so. Are, are you familiar with Akimbo? Uh, no. A-K-I-M-B-O dot C-A. That's, uh, that's the Toronto. Yeah, venue. it's the local one. All, any call to artists will be put on there. Uh, like right now, there's everything from painting those traffic boxes. I think that closes in the next couple of weeks or this week. Um, uh, there's one for a memorial where they're going to do um, laser cut panels and you just have to submit your drawing. So they're all on akimbo.ca. Yeah, you're fine. Right. Because we're working with communities, that's also a lot of very uh, like for instance. question of uh, Pierre. Thank you. Uh, you, you've been writing about this stuff that we call emergence, but I wonder how much have, has the sort of literature and scientific idea of emergent phenomena influenced the way you, the way you think about this stuff? I mean, do you, do you mind the, the scientific uh, thinking on this to, to inform your ideas, or are you sort of parallel track? No. Well, of course, um, Everything that uh, I have uh, my research uh, is um, different inside science, for instance, about uh, not only uh, the technological disciplines like uh, uh, artificial intelligence and um, artificial life. Uh, I have been uh, here, that is on just a part of my research. I participate also in uh, conferences about uh, um, new forms of, uh, of uh, generative arts, for instance. And um, but I am I, I come from uh, the humanities. I'm not a scientist. Uh, also, I have uh, uh, some. Um, I have also studies in in. Uh, in uh, the scientific realm. Uh, during the university, I had the examination of physics one, physics two, uh, rational mechanics, uh, and mathematical analysis one and two, ge geometry, 
Um, and so when I talk about these topics, uh, I have uh, I've done many lectures and it is not. The most difficult thing is that uh, is to put together like uh, uh, as you as it is written here in an in interdisciplinary way right. and and i think it it is uh, this is uh, the 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 vision that uh, artists and scientists have to 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 uh, to devote to the future and uh, um, especially in my country uh, my country has as uh, and a very important historical past, mm. for instance, in uh, not only in art but also in science, and uh, that has uh, often uh, put together art and science. Uh, for instance, the, the most important uh, uh, figure is Leonardo da Vinci. We have a beautiful uh, magazine that's called Leonardo, directed by Roger Malina, that deals with these topics. But now uh, I see that uh, in my country, but uh, I think in, in, uh, in um, many other countries in Europe, uh, uh, for many reasons that uh, it would be too long to, to, uh, to talk about here, uh, it seems that we are sticky uh, to the past. We are, uh, we are, uh, we are not uh, able to, to, to project. And it, it is a very, a, a very curious thing because as human, we... Uh, in some way, we, we, we have a fit in the future. Many and a lot of other activities are are bound to the future. So thinking just about the past seems, in some way, waste. And I think that it is possible to to overcome this impasse and this this stop just putting together different disciplines in an, in an interdisciplinary way. Then I have also had uh, lectures uh, in, also in, inside, inside uh, I was invited to many conferences that uh, are not uh, about humanities, but also in the scientific realm. And uh, I have been working in this theory of uh, the survive since 2008. So, are now 10 years. I just want to say uh, one last thing. That, uh, if anyone's interested, I have a few of these uh, up here. And it's a call for um, digital art submissions. Uh, that the city of Vaughan is doing a smart city uh, program, and they're asking people to submit their images or photographs, their whatever in digital form, uh, and I'm going to collage them together. So if you're interested in participating, there's a call to uh, for submissions on the back of this thing. And I hope to see some of you tomorrow. Um, yeah. I, I think I'm loud enough. <laughs> I hope to see some of you tomorrow. Tomorrow, same time, from 6 to 8, there is going to be uh, another uh, event. It is going to be very difficult, different. We're going to change. You're going you're gonna to see the Fields Institute changed. So if you're curious, come over. Thank you.